Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 22, The Bank Robbery. Whilst coming through historical newspaper articles, I came across a crime that had some interesting components to it that occurred in Deniliqua, New South Wales in 1859. On Saturday, the 15th of October 1859, the Bank of New South Wales was forcibly entered into by three armed men with blackened faces. Having entered through the back of the building via the kitchen, they presented revolvers and threatened the lives of the manager and the principal clerk, proceeding coolly to pinion them together, after which the scoundrels plundered the bank of silver, gold, notes and cheques amounting to nearly £7,400. That would be approximately $1.2 million today. It was widely published in the papers around the country. The Deniliquin Pastoral Times says, The manager, clerk and servant at the Bank of New South Wales, South Deniliquin, were stuck up by three armed men on Saturday night, and the bank safe was robbed of upwards of £7,000. The building occupied by the banking company is situated in an isolated part of the town, a considerable distance apart from other dwellings. It was situated on the corner of Charlotte and Russell Street, which is quite a fair way from the main street of Deniliquin where the current banks stand. And on this account, seemed to offer an easy prey to any scoundrels who might be disposed to risk personal danger for such a rich reward. In fact, it has often been a matter of remark amongst the town people that the local chroniclers of passing events would, some day or another, have to record the circumstances of a robbery at the bank, and these anticipations, uttered half in jest, have at length been realised. Precautions have been taken to guard against the emergency that has just occurred. Firearms were kept ready for the immediate use, and the bank property was secured in a large iron safe of great strength. The company, moreover, were about to remove to a more eligible premises, now in course of erection in the centre of town. The manager, Mr Miller, was in his private sitting room. Mr White, the clerk of the establishment, was writing letters in the bank office. The female servant was in the kitchen, which was a detached building at the rear, washing up the dinner things, and she was attended by a young female friend. This was about eight o'clock. The servant was alarmed by a noise of glass bottles being upset in the yard and on going out saw three strange men walking between the two buildings. She made the remark that they had no right to be sneaking about the back of the house and that if they really had any business there they ought to go to the front. On this she was pushed into the kitchen by one of the men and the other two went into the bank. The young woman, with great presence of mind, knowing that there was an outlet from the adjoining room by a canvas door, determined to attempt her escape in that direction. But the robber had gone around the building, and just as she was emerging, she pushed against the muzzle of a gun, and she was told that if she moved again, she would certainly be shot. She then returned to the kitchen, but was met at the outer door by her jailer. She now screamed loudly, and she continued screaming, notwithstanding threats of violence. In the meantime, Mr White had been quietly secured in the office. A man entered the room, placed a pistol at his head, and the victim had no choice but to have his hands tied. The servant's screams had been heard in the house, but excited no great alarm as it was known that the woman had a particular dread of blackfellows, and it was supposed that some of the Aborigines were about the place. However, Mr Miller went into the passage and looked into the bank room. The disguised stranger there, with his darkened visage, did look like a black fellow, and the manager, reassured, was about returning to the parlour, when he too was unpleasantly surprised by an armed man, who ordered him into the sitting room and demanded the key to the safe. Mr Miller, who had rapidly conceived a plan for ultimately discomforting the robbers, said that he should make no resistance and allowed his hands to be tied. He then produced the keys and with his captor proceeded to the adjoining room where the safe was. The depository of the treasure was unlocked, and the robber helped himself to over £5,000 in notes, numbers unknown, £2,100 in gold, and £30 in silver. 
taking a towel as a wrapper for his booty. Having accomplished the grand object of the plot, he left the building. On relieving the guard over the kitchen, they told the servant that they had done all that they wanted to do and that she might go as soon as she liked to release her masters. They then coolly and quietly walked away, positively walked, and throughout there was no hurry or excitement about their proceedings. The servant immediately went into the bank and cut the fastenings of the pinion gentleman. Mr Miller, seizing a firearm, rushed out of the house and fired in the direction the thieves had gone. Mr White hurried away to give information to the police. We have said that Mr Miller had conceived a plan for ultimately discomforting the scoundrels. This was his idea. His hands were tied in front and he was not so embarrassed by the fastenings as to be disabled from using firearms. He knew that on top of the large safe was a loaded revolver which might escape observation. When the man turned to leave the room, Mr Miller intended to secure the pistol and shoot him. At first, things went on hopefully. The robber did not quickly detect the presence of the deadly instrument. He had packed his swag and was in the act of leaving when he observed the revolver and took possession of it. Thus, Mr Miller's apparently well-founded hopes were frustrated. The police were quickly on the spot and the alarm being rapidly spread, a large number of townspeople assembled. By the light of the torches, a search was commenced, which resulted in the recovery of a large portion of the banknotes. By six o'clock on Sunday morning, upwards of £3,000 of property had been handed over to the manager. The notes were found strewn on the ground between the bank and a point of the lagoon behind Clifford's tent. There, one of the robbers had evidently taken off his disguise, leaving behind him a common wide-awake hat, a pair of moleskin trousers and his mask. The bank revolver was also found at this spot. On Saturday the 22nd of October, Sydney Morning Herald reported that there was an announcement of a reward of £300 that had been offered by the Bank of New South Wales for such information that will lead to an apprehension and conviction of the guilty parties. And this was to be increased to £500 upon the recovery of the property stolen. Eleven days after the robbery, it was reported in the Melbourne Argus. We have received intelligence that by the active exertions of Detective O'Neill, stationed at Sandhurst, now known as Bendigo, four men by whom the recent daring robbery of the Bank of New South Wales at Deniliquin is supposed to have been committed, were arrested on Sunday last at Echuca. They were taken to Deniliquin the following day, and the three of them were identified by Mr Miller, the manager of the bank, by Mr White, the accountant, and by the female servant, as the men who took part in the robbery. They are all well known to the Victorian Detective Police. They were brought up before Mr Kelly, the police magistrate, on the same day and remanded. Their names are stated to be William Henry alias Fitzgerald, a notorious burglar, Long Bill, otherwise known as Bill the Sawyer, Edward Keegan and Jack Vaughan. The greater portion of the large sum of money from the bank has since been recovered and a quantity of banknotes is stated to have been found in the possession of the prisoners. On the 3rd of November, Thomas Evans' father, Anne Evans' mother, and Thomas, James, Matthew and Mary Evans, the children of the two first-name prisoners, were placed at the bar on suspicion of being concerned in the bank robbery. They have been in custody for some time. Mr Smith, the Chief Constable, applied for a remand for one week. It will be seen by the above report that Thomas Evans Sr. And on Saturday the 5th of November, it was reported in the Dinaliquin Pastoral Times. Two men were brought up before the bench on Friday last, charged with being concerned with the late robbery at the Bank of New South Wales. They were remanded for further examination. Since Friday, several other persons have been arrested and all sorts of rumours are flying about. The tent of one of the men in custody was burned down on Tuesday and the little property that it contained was destroyed. The woman had been to see her husband in the lock-up and left her three children at home. In her absence, two or three men went to the tent and set fire to it. The children are too young to be able to identify the incendiaries. And on Wednesday the 9th of November, we hear that other parties have been arrested in Deniliquin on suspicion of being concerned in the late sticking up of the Bank of New South Wales at Deniliquin. It would appear that besides those already in custody, suspicion points to other parties. Indeed, it is rumoured in Deniliquin that the robbery was originally planned by a gang, which included 10 or a dozen different persons. 
It was reported in Sandhurst last night that a telegram had been received stating that £700 more has been recovered. On the 10th of November, it was reported that in a Deniliquin Police Court hearing on Monday, the 7th of November, Thomas Evans Sr., Anne Evans, Thomas Evans Jr., James Matthew and Mary Evans were remanded on the 31st and were again placed at the bar on suspicion of being concerned in the late bank robbery. George M. Carter, District Constable, being sworn, stated that he knew the prisoners at the bar and from information he had received, he believed them to be implicated in the robbery at the bank, which took place on the 15th of October. From circumstances which have subsequently come to his knowledge, he was convinced that the prisoners knew of the robbery before it took place. He prayed for a remand of eight days to enable him to bring forward further evidence. The prisoners were accordingly remanded until Monday next, with the exception of Matthew Evans, who was discharged from custody. He is a lad of weak intellect. Application for bail for the mother and daughter was requested. The police magistrate remarked that such a request was an unheard of proceeding in a robbery to so great an amount, and more particularly as a large quantity of the money was still missing. He would most certainly oppose the application. The application was refused. On the 17th of November, Thomas Evans, Anne Evans, Thomas Matthew and Mary Evans were again brought up in custody on suspicion of being concerned in the recent bank robbery. Mr Cutton defended the prisoners. The district constable applied for a further remand of eight days. Mr Cutton objected to this course. His clients had already been remanded three times and had been in custody for nearly a month. The required remand was accordingly granted. In the meantime, the bench would allow bail. The male prisoners, finding sureties of £50 each, the woman, two in £20, and the girl, £10. Bail having been offered and accepted for Mary Evans, she was released on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock. In the Empire, a Sydney paper reported at the police office in Lequin on the 1st of November, William Lee... William Henry Drew and John Vaughan were again brought up for the Dinaliquin bank robbery. In addition to the facts already known, the following was given in evidence. Edward Geegan deposed, I am a sawyer in the township and I know the prisoners at the bar. Had been sawing in partnership with the prisoner Drew for about three or four months. Was in Taylor's public house on the night of the robbery. I know where the prisoners were that night by being in confidence told of their proceedings. The arrangements to rob the bank were made at my tent. On the previous evening, the tall man, Lee, came to my tent to the pit where my mate and me was at work. It was finally settled that tomorrow night must decide the matter, that is, the robbery of the bank. It was in contemplation for a period of three weeks or a month before. It had been twice before attempted. The first failed from prisoner Vaughan getting drunk and not coming. The second failed too. They crossed the river, but one of their dogs slipped his chain and swam across the river to them. I was not present either time and only knew the arrangements from themselves. They dismissed the nature of the failure each time in my presence. I told them that they were living a reckless career and that they had better keep to their work and not throw a chance away. Nearly a week elapsed between each attempt a consultation took place at my soaring pit in the afternoon and they resolved to rob the bank the next night. On the Saturday afternoon, the day of the robbery, prisoner Drew went, after dinner, across the river with that intention. I did not see him until the following day when I was down at Taylor's Bar and saw Drew in company with old Evans, the sawyer. And I drank with them. Drew borrowed some money from Evans to pay. We took a bottle home with us and a fish that he had got from Evans. The principal part of the road home was spent in Evans praising Lee's conduct. He said the thing would have broken down but for his valuable assistance. After a minute or two in the tent, my mate sat down on his bunk. He got up and said he was going to divulge a secret. He came into my room and threw down a quantity of sovereigns on my bed and said that there were a few hundred of them. I left Drew and my little family at home and me and Evans proceeded to the town, made a purchase of a bottle of brandy and went home. From that time, we continued drinking. We came to blows and it appears he got worst of it and left the tent. I left matters as they were. 
I did not trouble myself about him until I was informed he was in the lockup. I then came into the township to look after him and borrowed two pound to pay his fine. He was fined by Mr Taylor. I borrowed the money to hide the rest if I could. I heard them, Lee and Drew, plan to disguise themselves. They were to darken their faces I told them not to wear crepe as they would make a down upon the Sawyers at once. I saw pistols in their possession. There was one, a six-barrel revolver. It formerly did belong to me, but it belonged to Drew. Just a side note, in July 1855 at Warren Heap near Bunnanyong, Edward Geegan was charged with stealing a gun, the property of Bartholomew Fullen. It is to be assumed that the gun that Edward stole back in 1855 was in fact the gun that he gave to the men in order to assist in robbing the bank. The six barrel revolver produced is the one. I loaded the pistols for the prisoners on one occasion, the first going off. I did not see them load the pistols again. Drew told me that when he went across the river to Lee's tent to dress, that was to be their meeting place for the affair. Drew, in going, went, I believe, across the punt, and in coming to the bank, they took Evans's boat to do it. I heard them say that there were three of them in it. I did not see Vaughan in it. My mate said he was. Lee was to be the man to come to stick up by means of the revolver and other firearms, and Drew to extract the money from the chest, and the third man to be in attendance outside with a double-barrelled piece. The double-barrelled piece was got at a house across the river. It was clandestinely got for the occasion. They told me they threw it into the river. I slept that night in my own tent. I saw none of the prisoners that night after Drew left in the afternoon. I heard the result of the attack on the bank before I went home. I made myself as conspicuous as possible at Taylor's so that I could prove an alibi. When I next saw Drew on the Sunday, he gave me the history of the whole proceedings while we were walking home from Taylor's to the tent. Evans was present while we walked down to the tent. Evans heard all of the conversation. I was ignorant that Evans was aware of the robbery until the Sunday after it. He told me himself then that he was the planner of the robbery. I was promised £1,500 as my share, £1,300 first, and then Drew told me they had made up £1,500 for me. It was to give me a start as a poor man. It was not with a view to keep me quiet. A Mrs Sullivan was with us. I believe she was ignorant of the affair. I think Drew gave her 37 sovereigns. 44 sovereigns remained and I gave them to Mr Smith. I heard them ask for ropes. I saw Drew bring one or two from my tent. I heard him say to bind the bankers. The rope in my hand is very like the other. I suppose Drew meant to astonish me with a sight of gold when he came into my room and said he had a secret to divulge. Previous to this, it was no secret to me. I knew the identical time it was to be attempted. He, Drew, did not know and could not say what the amount taken was. I never ascertained. Samuel John Snell sworn. I'm the barman at Taylor's Public House. I know Edward Geegan. I recollect on Wednesday the 19th that Geegan changed two sovereigns in the purchase of liquors. The same day he borrowed two pounds in notes from Mr Taylor. This was said to be to pay a fine. William Barber, Chief Constable at Moama, originally called Maiden's Punt, deposed to having apprehended the prisoner Vaughan on the 24th, a mile down the river from Moama, was present at the arrest of William Lee at South Deniliquin near the courthouse, was at Geegan's tent on Saturday on the 22nd searching for money but got none, found two cords there now produced. On comparing them with one of the cords left at the bank, found them to be the same piece, was present with Chief Constable Smith on the 24th when 44 sovereigns were found near Geegan's tent underneath a log. Henry Smith, Chief Constable at Deniliquin, deposed to having arrested the prisoner Drew on the 20th, which was the means of bringing this robbery to light. The prisoners declined to make any statement and were fully committed to take their trial at the next Goulburn Circuit Court in March 1860. On the 18th of November, it was reported that another portion of the money stolen from the New South Wales Bank at Deniliquin had been recovered and the booty was found secreted in the carcass of a dead bullock. And this sum reduced the total loss to about £1,700. Several sums of money, 
the proceeds of the bank robbery have lately been discovered buried in the earth on the north side of the river. It is rumoured that Geegan, who was the principal witness against the three men committed for trial, has been under surveillance of the police at Moama and has bolted. It would seem that he did not make known to the police all the plants of gold of which he was cognizant, as it stated that he has been spending sovereigns freely up the Murray. On the 28th of December, the Geegan family were brought up on Tuesday before John Phillips, Esquire JP. The Chief Constable stated that he was not prepared to go on with the case as his witness from Victoria could not be here before the 27th. The prisoners were accordingly remanded for eight days. Geegan said that there were two young children in the locker who were not concerned in the case as he was in confinement he had no means of procuring them food. Until that morning they had been supplied with rations at public cost but now this has stopped. Mrs Geegan said that she had no means of supporting the children as the police had taken all the money, which was 217 gold sovereigns. She said she had worked very hard for, and there was laughter in the court at that comment. Hers was a very hard case, and Mr Phillips made the necessary order to supply food to the children. We now go to the 20th of January 1860, and it was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald that the Geegan family, who have been so many times remanded in our police court on charges connecting them with the robbery of the bank in October, have at last been disposed of. The male prisoner was brought up Monday last and committed for trial, his own statement being admitted as conclusive evidence against him. His wife was brought up the following day before the police magistrate and J. Phillips JP with some additional evidence that was taken. The first witness was J.C. Carter, the district constable, who deposed having been on duty with the police magistrate in the month of November and on the morning of the 5th went in company with the police magistrate, Mr. Miller, Mr. White of the bank and Evan's two sons to where Geegan's tent had been to search for some of the bank money that had been stolen. After searching for a considerable time, on passing the remains of a dead bullock, I looked inside and saw something which I took for a bone. I moved it with a stick and found it was not. I called upon the police magistrate. He said, lift up the body. I did so and we found a towel rolled up and pinned in three places, on opening which we found it contained banknotes. Inside the notes were another roll of some notes and four sovereigns inside the notes. The towel was round the outer parcel, a piece of shawl around the smaller parcel. I then went into Geegan's tent. It had been burnt and I found the piece of shawl which I hold in my hand. I was called upon by the police magistrate to compare the pieces of shawl. I found them to be of the same pattern as those round the parcel and both had been burnt. I recognised them to be of the same pattern as the shawl that I saw on Mrs Geegan about a fortnight before the bank was robbed. William Barber, Chief Constable at Moama, was next called. He said he had had some conversation with the prisoner and on the 16th of November was informed by her that she had planted £1,000 in a dead beast, that it was the bank's money and part of Drew's swag, that Sergeant Carter had found it and said that there was only £700, that he meant to stick to the rest and divide it with Kelly and that she would lag the pair of them and witness too, meaning Mrs Geegan was claiming that Sergeant Carter and John Kelly, the Chief Magistrate, were keeping £300 to themselves and if she went to jail, they will too. It was a threat. Interesting, in 1863, John Kelly, the Chief Magistrate, was dismissed from his post as he was found to be misappropriating funds. Mr White, the accountant of the bank, was recalled and identified some of the notes from the way in which they were mutilated and deposed to have been present when the parcel of money was found in the dead bullock near Geegan's tent. The police magistrate then entered the witness box and, being sworn, stated, From the information I received, I believe there was a large sum of money quite close to Geegan's tent. The chief constable was absent on duty and, being very short of men at the time, I thought it was only right that I should proceed to make a search of the money. All of us were making a search about the tent. About 100 or 150 yards from the tent, we came to a dead bullock, which had been there some time. I said to the district constable, we had better lift that bullock. The money might be buried under the body. I caught hold of the foreleg and turned it over, and in doing so, I heard something rattle inside like a parcel. I then caught hold of the other leg and separated them out. I told the district constable to search the body, and he did so. He put his hand in and found a parcel in the body of the bullock. We immediately suspected it was the money or portion of it. We opened the parcel. It contained a parcel of notes. 
I laid down the notes on the ground and said to the district constable that we must call up the bankers. I whistled for them and Mr Miller and Mr White came up. I pointed out the money to them and I told them how it was found and on my examining it in the presence of the three, I found a piece of shawl that I now hold in my hand in all five pieces. I am positive that I saw that shawl on Mrs Geegan on the morning of the 24th of October at the courthouse door. I then rolled up the money and proceeded to the bank, the four of us. We proceeded to count the money and found it to contain £712, four of which were sovereigns. During the time Mrs Geegan's husband was in the lockup, she came to me and told me she had no mode of living, that her tent and all she possessed was burnt by two men who came there with their faces blackened and threatened to throw the children into the fire. Believing this at the time, I gave an order to the Chief Constable to issue rations to her and her children. I afterwards found that she had imposed upon me, as from information I have received, I have cause to believe that she burnt the tent herself. She went every length to make me believe her destitution. A constable named John Martin was then examined and swore that the towel wrapped around the notes was the same as the one given to him by the prisoner to dry his face when on duty at the tent on the 23rd of October. The case was then remanded and brought on again on Thursday before the police magistrate when Mr Miller, the acting manager of the bank, having identified some of the notes, the prisoner was committed to Goulburn for trial on charge of having in her possession money, well knowing the same to be stolen. Just a little side note, in John Bushby's Salt Bush Country, the history of the Deniliquin District, something that wasn't mentioned in the pastoral times, was that the Chief Constable was quick to enlist the talents of members of the local tribe of Aborigines. One Aboriginal named Skelly, who was a good tracker, pointed to a spot where money had been buried in the ground and to the carcass of a bullock, in which the police found £712 tied in a piece of shawl. For his work, the Aboriginal was promoted to King Skelly and presented with a brass plate denoting his rank. Skelly afterwards adopted the bank as his personal responsibility and made a nuisance of himself by squatting in front of the bank during business hours to the embarrassment of all. And I'm quite confident that the Skelly referred to is William Skelly, who is in my bonus episode with the, the ladies from Warren Gesda Mission, where William Skelly was married to Daisy Lewis's mother, who was Archie Murphy's wife from the Tracker episode. On the 27th of March, 1860, the court proceedings on the bank robbery at Deniliquin had commenced, and it said that William Henry Drew, John Vaughan and William Lee were indicted for having, on the 15th of October, a Deniliquin feloniously broken into the premises of the Bank of New South Wales, being in the occupation of one George Miller and stolen a certain sum of money at the value of £7,850. The prisoners pleaded not guilty. Vaughan and Lee were defended by Mr Blake, attorney, and Mr Ganson, and Drew was undefended. The Crown Prosecutor in opening the case said it was one of larceny with aggravation, which charge in law was constituted by the sum stolen being above five pounds, and from the fact of the inmates being at the time of the robbery placed in bodily fear. The crime was a very serious one, considering the amount of money that had been stolen, the nature and the circumstances of the robbery, and the importance of protecting such institutions as banks in thinly inhabited parts of the country. The question, however, for the jury principally to consider was one of identity. One feature of identification would be the height of the prisoners, more especially as regarded Lee, Another thing was the sound of their voices. The identification of the prisoners was even made when the prisoners were dressed in other clothes. When those clothes that had been worn at the robbery were put on by prisoners, they were identified by the manager of the bank and the clerk without the slightest hesitation. In this case, one of the accomplices, Edward Geegan, had turned Queen's evidence against the prisoners and his testimony would corroborate that of the other witnesses. Geegan had been a sharer of the plunder and the fact that part of the money was found near Geegan's tent was confirmatory of the truth of his evidence. So, in other words, Geegan turned and became an informant in order to uncover the three men that committed the robbery. The first witness was George Miller. I'm the manager of the Bank of New South Wales at Deniliquin. The first time that I again saw the prisoners, Lee and Drew, was at the police court on the 24th. I identified Lee then as having been the tall man in the robbery. I also identified Drew by his voice. I identified the tall man by his voice and his features. 
Mr White was not present when I identified the prisoners. We did so separately. The ropes produced are very much like the ropes with which we were tied. I afterwards saw Lee dressed in the clothes found in the lagoon and I then distinctly swore to him. The cloth was covered over the short man's face in the bank with holes in it for his eyes. Between five and ten minutes occurred from the time of the men's coming and leaving. The shorter man had bright, clear eyes. He had a blue serge shirt on. The other man had an old black frock coat and a California hat. The first time I saw Lee, I identified him by his look at once. His face was not well blackened on the occasion of the robbery. I saw the prisoners in the jail yesterday and I went to see Drew in particular. Robert Hoddle Dryberg White sworn, I was the acting accountant in the Bank of New South Wales at Deniloquin. I recognised the voice of Drew when he was up on charge of drunkenness before he was apprehended for the robbery. This was on the 17th. Prisoners were apprehended on the 24th. I swore to the tall man by his sharp features in his voice. I also recognised Drew by his peculiar gruff voice. I swear that the prisoners Lee and Drew are the same as they are engaged in the robbery at the bank. On the 19th, I went to the police office as I was informed by a magistrate that a man was there answering the description I had given of one of the robbers. And just a side note at this point, Robert White later became a notable New South Wales politician, so he gained quite a bit of notoriety in political circles later on in his life. Mrs Mary Neal deposed, I was living in the bank at Dinaliquin on the occasion of the robbery. I was in the kitchen and I heard a voice which I thought was the goats. I then saw a small man. I then heard a noise and saw a second man whose face was blackened. I screamed and a man told me to go in and be quiet. He locked the kitchen door and I screamed the more. I was trying to get out the back when he came and told me to keep quiet and held a gun to my head. I saw this man's face and held a candle close to it. I afterwards saw the man in the police court who presented the gun at me and also the man who told him not to do so. Amelia Lucas gave evidence confirmatory to a certain extent of the last witness. This witness identified the man Vaughan by his manner of walking. He did not walk straight. John Kelly, the police magistrate at Dinaliquin, deposed. I know the prisoners. They were brought before me for examination on the 24th of October. Vaughan and Lee were apprehended at Dinaliquin. I think that they were in Dinaliquin the whole of the time. Mr Blake made an able defence. The Crown Prosecutor replied and his honour, having carefully summed up, the jury retired and after a short absence returned a verdict of guilty against the three prisoners and were remanded until the next day for sentence. When they were brought up for sentence, they were asked if they had anything to say why the sentence should not be passed upon them. Prisoner Drew handed in a written statement purporting to his defence. The substance of the document was that on the night of the 15th when the bank was robbed, he was not away from his tent the whole night and that Geegan had sworn falsely against him in order to screen himself and take revenge on him as they had had a quarrel previously about Geegan's wife. Geegan suspected him of too great familiarity with her. The other two prisoners said nothing. The judge in passing sentence observed that the prisoners had been convicted upon evidence which could not leave the slightest doubt of their guilt upon the mind of anyone who bought it. And if the defence of Drew had been read to the jury, as it might have been, he did not believe it would in the slightest degree have affected their decision. As to Lee and Drew, he saw no reason to give their case the slightest consideration, and he sentenced them severally to ten years' hard labour on the roads, the first two years in irons, and as to Vaughan, there were circumstances which led him to believe he wasn't so much concerned in the planning and the concocting of the robbery as the others, and though placed under arms to prevent the females from giving an alarm, he fortunately for himself did not, when the alarm was given, do any violence to them. On these grounds, he made a slight difference to the sentence, eight years hard labour, on the roads or public works, making no order as to working in irons. Just before the trial at Goulburn, Lee, Drew and Vaughan with others were involved in an attempt to escape from Goulburn Jail by tunnelling under the wall. When discovered they had tunnelled for a distance of 18 feet and were beyond the jail wall, Lee, Drew and Vaughan each received terms of seven years in Goulburn Jail. On the 6th of January 1860, it was reported from the Dineliquin Police Court Edward Geegan was charged with being concerned in the recent bank robbery. John Cameron, Detective Constable of Castlemaine, Victoria. 
I arrested the prisoner on the 30th of November in consequence of a telegram received from Sergeant O'Neill. On bringing him to the camp at Castlemaine, I searched him. I found on his person 16 to 18 shillings in silver. I arrested him on the charge of being connected with the bank robbery. I arrested at the same time Margaret Geegan and her daughter on the same charge. William Barber, I am the Chief Constable at Moama and know the prisoner in the dock. He gave me two sovereigns on the 20th of November. He told me they belonged to the bank and that I ought to take them for pocket money. Geegan was spending sovereigns all the time he was at Moama, that is, since the bank robbery. I saw him at Moama in August last and he was begging his way. No person was present when he gave me the two sovereigns. He offered me, at another time, 200 sovereigns to allow him to go to Melbourne. He promised not to leave Moama without my permission. He left to go to Melbourne on the 30th of November. He was at large while at Moama. I recollect Geegan being charged at Denilicon with the bank robbery and he was then discharged. Margaret Geegan and Margaret Geegan Jr. were charged with receiving stolen monies, knowing them to have been stolen. John Cameron said, I arrested the prisoners at Castlemaine on the 30th November between the hours of 8 and 9 at night. I arrested them from information I received from O'Neill on the charge of being connected with the bank robbery at Deniliquin. I caused them to be searched by my wife, who took them into our office. After they had been there for a short time, I heard a scream. I went into the room and saw my wife struggling with the elder prisoner. Each of them held hold of a calico belt. I took it from them and opened it, found it to contain 148 sovereigns, which appeared to have been buried a short time before. I saw the belt which I hold in my hand, taken from the person of the younger prisoner. I opened it and found it contained 69 sovereigns. When I arrested the elder prisoner, she said, I know what you want me for. It is for the bank robbery, adding, you are out this time, old man. Catherine Cameron, I reside at Castlemaine. I am the wife of John Cameron. I remember my husband directing me to search the prisoners, Margaret Geegan Sr. and Jr. on the 30th November. She allowed me to search her, saying that she had no money. I stripped her naked, and while taking some of her petticoats, she untied a string herself. The belt I hold in my hand, she had outside her shift. She untied the string of the belt and tried to conceal it by putting it behind her back. I tried to take it and we had a scuffle. When my husband came into the room, she then dropped it on the ground. After the men left the room, she said, If you asked me if I had money, I would have given you £20 to have said nothing about it. She said she had earned the money by washing and dressing. I then searched the girl and found a belt on her which contained 69 sovereigns. Robert Hoddle, Dryberg White. The bank was robbed on the 15th of October in the amount of £8,000. I cannot swear that the money produced is the property of the bank. Judged by other monies I have found, I believe that it is. The prisoners were remanded for eight days. Mr Cutton appeared for the defendants. On Thursday, March the 29th, 1850, Edward Geegan and Margaret Geegan, man and wife, were indicted for feloniously receiving certain monies and other articles at Deniliquin on the 15th of October, knowing that the said property had been feloniously stolen. They pleaded not guilty and were undefended. As regarded Geegan, it was quite clear from his own confession when he became an approver and from other circumstances that he had received portion of the booty. With respect to his wife, Margaret Geegan, it was no less clear that she had been concerned in the concealment of portions of the money and in the spending of other portions. But in accordance to law, she was protected by coverture. If she did it in obedience to her husband, the question for the jury, as put by the judge, was whether she had received any portion of the money in the absence of her husband and if this was the onus of proof that lay on the Crown. Upon this point, the evidence was very slight. If, said the judge, the jury found she did so receive any portion of the money, they must find her guilty. Another question he put to the jury for their decision was, did she receive the money in the presence of her husband and afterwards dispose of it in his absence? If they found she did this, they must, under his direction, find her guilty. After a deliberation of 10 minutes, the jury found a verdict of guilty against the husband and not guilty against the wife. The latter was accordingly discharged. The former was sentenced to two years hard labour in Darlinghurst Jail. It had previously been stated by the Crown Prosecutor that though there was no promise made to Geegan in this case, 
It had been held that in cases where a prisoner gave evidence for the Crown, a promise was implied. The judge, in reply to an application from Geegan that he would take into consideration the service he had rendered in connection with the prosecution for robbery, that the sum of £1,200 of the money stolen from the bank still remains uncovered. Edward Geegan did, in fact, go to jail. There was no mercy, even when he did submit evidence to the court. In the Deniliquin Genealogy Society book, Deniliquin and District Pioneers, Volume 1, there was a reference to the Deniliquin bank robbery. In that book, there was a story about Fred Burrows, a local man, and it mentions that Fred was here when the first bank of New South Wales was robbed in 1859, and he recalled this event when the Pastoral Times interviewed him in 1908. His version is that a sawyer named Geegan planned the robbery and three others, Drew, Lee and Vaughan, carried it out. All the notes and sovereigns they could carry they wrapped in towels and in a hurry they dropped some hundreds of pounds. A reward of £500 had been offered for information leading to the conviction of the thieves and Geegan turned informer and put the whole show away. Lee and Drew were sentenced for 10 years and Vaughan for seven after the trial, Geegan returned to Deniliquin and later left by coach with his family for Bendigo. When they got to Moira, a detective joined the coach and travelled with them. At Bendigo, Geegan and his wife were searched. Their daughter was next searched and £700 was found sewn up in her corset. At some stage after this robbery, Fred was exercising some racehorses when he found part of the booty inside a stump. So interesting, I think there were quite a few locals that were finding money hidden away and money lying around. So what became of the four men that were charged? Well, firstly, William Henry Drew. There's a jail record of William Henry Drew in 1844 where he was tried for forgery and he is recorded as being born in 1822 in England and he sailed to Australia in 1842 on the Duke of Manchester. His Goulburn jail record, though, stated he was born in Sydney and his trade is recorded as a shipwright. His age was recorded at 36 at the time that he was tried for the robbery, which would have made his birth year as 1824. This record stated that he had one previous conviction. However, there's another record that states that he has no previous convictions. He had tattoos on the back of his hands, which aided in the identification of Drew in the robbery trial. So outlining the forgery case, on the 18th of July 1844 in Sydney, so when he was 20, a person named William Henry Drew was apprehended by Constable Carroll on Tuesday evening on suspicion of forging two cheques at the commercial bank of upwards of £60 purporting to be drawn by the firm of Martin and Coombs and a Dr Robinson Roebuck was taken into custody on the same evening on suspicion of being an accessory to the forgery. Two other parties, George Hill and William Laxton, have been in custody during the week on the same charge and it's supposed that the information given by them has led to the apprehension of Drew and Roebuck, both of whom have the appearance of respectable persons, who would not otherwise have been suspected of being concerned in the transaction. On the 28th of October 1844 at the Supreme Court in Sydney, William Henry Drew was convicted of forgery before his honour the Chief Justice on Saturday October 12th and was brought up for sentence. His honour observed that he had received a recommendation in favour of the prisoner, most respectably signed and imputing his offence to the contagious example of bad company. It had transpired that the prisoner had been instrumental in the commission of two other forgeries, of which he and his unprincipled companions had received the proceeds. The court must, for the protection of society, punish with severity for crimes of this nature, and the prisoner was sentenced to be transported for life with intimation that a representation would be made to His Excellency recommending that it should be mitigated to five years in consequence of the prisoner's youth and the recommendation of the jury and others in his favour, which he obviously did get just five years. We already know that the three of them tried to escape from Goulburn Jail. By the time he got to 13th of August 1860, he is recorded in Sydney. It says there have been some disturbances at Cockatoo Island owing to the change of regulations as to the tickets of leave and one of them was Drew under sentence for the Deniliquin bank robbery, and he was the principal person in these disturbances. And he was also recorded as being at Parramatta Jail on the 13th of June, 1867. 
After that point, the child goes cold on William Drew. There's no information that arises about him after this entry. William Lee, also known as Long Bill or Bill the Sawyer. William was born in England in 1829. He listed himself as a tailor in his jail record. He was 39 when convicted for the bank robbery. In his jail record, he is described as a malingerer, so someone who feigns illness. And he was also termed as a notorious burglar whose alias was Fitzgerald, where he got himself into some trouble in Victoria. After sentencing, he was also sent to Cockatoo Island in April 1860. William Lee got six months added to his sentence because he tried to escape Cockatoo Island in April 1861 and he was punished by being confined to his cell for 28 days. He was subsequently returned to Darlinghurst Jail. But by the 29th of May 1861, so a month later, there was an article in the paper, Violent Affray at Darlinghurst Jail. A desperate attack was early on Wednesday morning made by a portion of the refractory Cockatoo Island prisoners removed to confinement in Darlinghurst upon Mr Wallace, one of the warders. The desperados, the leaders of whom were Lee, an accomplice in the Deniloquin bank robbery, and nine others were being returned to their cells from airing in the yard and having ascended the staircase of the trial wing and reached the top range of cells, a rush was made upon Wallace, whom they assailed with stones, kicked and attempted to throw over the iron railing. A fall from this height upon the flagstones beneath would have almost been fatal. The noise of the affray being heard below, Mr Reed, who was at the door of the wing, hastened up the staircase with the senior warder, and with the energy rendered by the warders and the prisoner wardsmen, the assailants were beaten off and the whole of them put in irons. This assault appeared to have been, on this occasion, entirely unprovoked, and as a result of this, William was sentenced to three years hard labour for his involvement, and he was moved to Parramatta Jail. By April 1863, he was then moved to Berrimer Jail. And then there's an article at Berrima by August 1863. Last night when prisoners in Berrima Jail were being locked up, one of them refused to deliver up his clothes for the night, which has been the custom lately. When they were being taken from him, he forcibly struck Mr Small, the jailer, with a piece of wood wrenched from his bedboard. Water Spinks rushed forward and received the blow. The man was ultimately overpowered and placed in the cell. This morning when the prisoners numbered about 70, they mustered in the mess room for breakfast. They locked the door and barricaded it and refused to surrender until they had seen the sheriff. The ringleaders are principally cockatoo men recently sent here, and among them are Lee of the Deniliquin Bank robbery notoriety. So after this incident, he was returned to Darlinghurst Jail. In February 1864, he was sent to Cockatoo Island again. In April 1865, he was deemed unfit for work and sent back to Darlinghurst Jail. And then in October 1864, he was classed as an invalid and sent back to Berrima Jail. In April 1866, Lee was involved in another incident. On the 14th of April, 11 prisoners were ordered under the Sheriff's warrant to be removed from Berrima Jail to Darlinghurst Jail. One of Cobb's coaches were employed to convey them and there was a police escort of three constables, Mitchell, Kilpatrick and Raymond, under the command of Senior Sergeant Healy, who was appointed to convey them to Sydney. The prisoners were handcuffed by one hand, the other loop of the hand being locked to a chain. The police were each armed with a rifle and a six-chamber revolver. They proceeded on until they came to Anderson's public house at Bargo, where they were taken out, marched to an enclosed yard at the back and supplied with dinner. It was in this enclosure at the public house that the plot for disarming the police and escaping from custody was designed. Lee was part of a group of eight men. The ringleaders had by some means provided themselves with two handcuff keys and while having dinner they secretly tried if they would fit. All went on quietly until a coach arrived at a lonely part of the road at Bargo Brush about 10 miles from Picton, and about 200 yards from the public house that they had just left. Three prisoners attempted to drag the sergeant off the box seat into the coach, but he managed to extricate himself, jumped off and stumbled. Three prisoners attacked Constable Raymond, and after a struggle he managed to get out. Two or three prisoners attacked Constable Mitchell, 
After failing with the sergeant, probably four or five tried to disarm him, but he held fast with his firearms, though at one moment his nose was in jeopardy of being bitten off by one of his assailants. The sergeant then pointed his revolver at Crookle, called upon him to surrender, and in reply, Crookle fired at the sergeant, but the ball whizzed past his beard only and struck Raymond under the left eye, penetrating his brain and killing him instantly. As the sergeant still had four shots left, and Mitchell and Kilpatrick still held their firearms, the prisoners on their return cried out, We surrender, we've done our best and failed. This whole event took no longer than four minutes. Crookle was committed by the Picton coroner on the 10th of April for willful murder of Constable Raymond, and on the 7th of May, the other prisoners named were committed as being accessories before and after the fact, which was the equivalent to the charge of murder, and all placed in the same indictment. Six prisoners, including Lee, were condemned to be hanged for the murder of Constable Raymond at Bargain Brush, but the sentence was afterwards commuted to life imprisonment. On the 9th of July, 1866, there was an article that mentioned that the remainder of the convicts implicated in the murder of Constable Raymond at Bargo Brush have been removed to Berrima Jail. Once sent back to Berrima Jail, these men were placed in solitary confinement and were also kept in irons. Crookle was hanged on the 3rd of July, 1866, at Darlinghurst Jail. He maintained his innocence of the murder of Constable Raymond, but acknowledged that he had committed a murder previously. On the 25th of August, 1885, there was an article that mentioned that John Burke, alias Jockey Burke, alias Wilson, alias Turner, alias Dickens, aged 43, and William Lee, aged 60, were charged with being suspected persons frequenting Belmore Park with intent to commit a felony. The officers caught the prisoners engaged in overhauling the pockets of a drunken man lying asleep on the grass. The police gave both prisoners the character of being notoriously clever criminals, both having served sentences. Lee was one of the Bargo Brush men that was sentenced to death, with the sentence being afterwards commuted to life imprisonment and the prisoner subsequently liberated. The prisoners were sent to jail for six months each. So William's still up to his old tricks even at the age of 60. John Vaughan, the third involved. John was born in England in 1806 and he was 54 at the time of the bank robbery. He came out on the ship The Asia when he was 29 years old and he was listed as a shoemaker on his jail record. He had no previous conviction before the robbery and I'm thinking that he was sentenced to eight years without irons because of his age. He was deemed too weak and incapable of hard labour so he was sent to Berrima Jail. He was released from Berrima Jail in August 1866. He had received 16 months remittance so he basically got early release. Unfortunately, it didn't take long before he was arrested again. He returned to Deniliquin and with James Fay and Thomas Taylor, they were charged with forging a cheque worth a little over £38 in March 1867. He was sentenced to a further five years on the road gangs and was discharged from Parramatta Jail in February 1871. And the fourth involved, Edward Geegan. He was born at Kells, County Meath, Ireland in 1813 but he states he was born in Manchester, England, on the New South Wales jail entrance file. He listed his age as 40 in the jail entrance book, but in fact would have been 47 years old when he was convicted for his part in the robbery. And he also gave his age as 40 when his son William was born in 1863. He was taken to court in Dinaliquin on the 16th of January 1960, remanded, sent to Goulburn, and then sentenced on the 29th of March 1860. Towards the last few months of his confinement at Darlinghurst Jail, Edward was becoming restless. In the jail muster books on the 10th of January 1862, Edward's recorded as destroying government property, receiving a penalty of four hours solitary confinement, and on the 14th of March 1862, charged with destroying a shirt, which was the penalty of one day solitary confinement. The Darlinghurst Jail discharge book shows that Edward was disposed of on the 28th of March 1862, with his sentence expired and him being free. Following Edward's release from prison, his wife joined him and they moved north to Murrurundi, where William was born, another child, in 1863. 
Edward's wife was incorrectly named as Margaret in connection to the robbery. Her name, in fact, was Catherine. And there is a big story attached to her and also further research done into Edward in pre-Australia. There's a lot more with Edward Geegan than first expected. He, in fact, was a soldier, a deserter. He was a mercenary in Spain, a highwayman robber and an escapee before the robbery at Deniliquin. There is so much more to Edward's story that I'm going to do a bonus episode. And thanks to one of the descendants of Edward Geegan, John Kirkpatrick who co-wrote a fantastic account of Edward and Mary and their descendants, I will present Edward and Catherine in their own standalone story. So a sensational occurrence back in a tiny little town of Deniliquin in those days, and certainly by the amount of articles that are archived, it was a sensational case at the time. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.